Hi, and welcome to Sustainability Explored. Every week, this podcast navigates a new topic through the interviews with the most disruptive minds in sustainability, turning their experiences working behind the scenes into actionable advice you can use in your life, no matter your background. My name is Anna. I am an environmentalist, sustainability consultant, and the host of this very show. We continue our season seven with a, super, with a super exciting and interesting, hopefully so, interview on climate positive bamboo building. And today with us, uh, we have Troy Carter, co-founder of Rizome. In one second, we will welcome Troy and start this exciting journey with him. Troy, I'm super happy to welcome you at Sustainability Explored. Thank you so much for being on the show, for showing up, for being uh, ready to share your knowledge in uh, sustainability, in building materials, in your uh, topic. But first, I wanted to ask you, how did you find your way into sustainability? Hmm. Yeah, first, thanks for having me. I mean, I think like... You know, I'm what I'm 31. I think most people in this generation, younger, older, but I, pretty much everyone now is getting the sense that if what ecology is important, uh, the climate is changing very rapidly and that needs to be addressed, um, that this is really one of the major themes of this decade. And you know, I think, I think I grew up with that perspective um, and many people are. And I, I had a, I would say a fairly conventional work career. You know, I was an early employee at Airbnb and worked at another hardware company, started my own company and sold it after a couple of years. And the last handful of years um, was mostly not working, but occasionally consulted for environmental or um, you know, other regenerative agriculture energy projects. And Rhizome is the first project that has my full-time attention again. And what do we do at Rhizome? Rhizome makes climate positive bamboo engineered lumber. So what, what does that mean? So we make houses, like in the world, we make houses out of steel and concrete and wood generally. And if countries like Indonesia, India, Bangladesh, Sub-Saharan Africa, if all the buildings that are built in these areas will be built out of steel and concrete, we're going to hit some major climate thresholds that we really don't want to hit. And so there needs to be an alternative. So building with trees is a pretty good example of you know plants sequester CO2 from the atmosphere and put that CO2 into the built environment, which is the largest carbon sink that has been created by human beings. It's a pretty good technology. However, you know, you go to a, you know, you go to Ethiopia or you go to Indonesia or you go to India, there are no trees left. And so, and the cycle for growing a new crop of trees is too long for it to be a relevant material for creating a mass timber industry uh, in most equatorial or tropical regions. In the US and Western Europe and Scandinavia, they do a pretty good job at uh, harvesting trees sustainably. Um, but most regions of the world have been completely exploited with almost 100% deforestation. So there needs to be another technology. So that's what we're introducing. We're introducing bamboo as a building technology to replace wood, steel, and concrete, where the paradigm shifts from from destroying the climate to actually the more that you build, the better the climate impacts. So the more you build with bamboo, the more CO2 you sequester from the atmosphere, and the more land use you transition from uh, plantations of trees, which have very low uh, biomass production, to bamboo, which has about 10 times the amount of bin building material produced on every acre. So that's, that's the business that I'm running right now. And how did I get into it? One, I would say, um, I mean, I didn't, I didn't come at this with an architectural or building materials or lumber industry background whatsoever. 
um, I came at it with the question, how do I make a, how do I make a real impact in climate, ecological systems and, you know, economic, social, ecological justice. And to me, that was uh, an entrepreneurial question that the ecological crisis will not be solved probably through philanthropy and through land conservation as we have conventionally known it. Just as a case study in Mindanao in the Philippines where most of our operations are, you know, there have been large scale reforestation efforts, most of which have failed with very low survivability rates of the trees. And why is that? So one, there are grass fires. So the ecology has been destabilized to a point where trees don't um, actually, can't actually regrow in their natural environment. Um, and local people are not incentivized to maintain the trees. And so they run their cattle on them or they don't maintain the trees. So there has to be uh, work on many levels to actually make a strong positive shift in climate and ecology. And it's not just by removing CO2 from the atmosphere, but it's by uh, encouraging uh, agency of indigenous peoples over their land, uh, economic incentives where people are not threatened by fundamental food security um, and, and creating reliable supply chains for local people to have have uh, you know markets for their products mm -hmm. so it's it's complex and so my goal was to at least tackle some of the complexities of what it means to do something good for for conserving ecosystems and uh, stabilizing the climate so human beings and other species don't get wiped out it's a pretty complex idea to come up with you know, just one day you know, woke up and, oh, why don't I do something environmentally conscious? Bamboo is, is quite a serious um, material. How old is the company, Rhizome? And what does the name mean? I think it's interesting so to explore. The rhizome, so bamboo is a grass. The rhizome is the internodal underground root structure of grass that essentially stores a bunch of energy and sends up shoots. Um, so it's the reason why bamboo grows so quickly. So uh, just to give a sense of scale uh, in um, whatever, in US measurements, the bamboo we grow is like 10 to 12 inches in diameter or 100, 120 feet tall. So it's really, really large grass. And it's about as regenerative as mowing your lawn, right? It's just, we're mowing a very, very large lawn of grass. Um, and turning it into something useful, building materials. Um, for sure, I didn't wake up one day and say, hey, I think bamboo is the solution that is going to change the world. Um, you know, there have been people working in this field. How did this idea reach for many you? How, years. What happened? <laughs> this is what I'm trying what to dig into. Yeah, so a friend of mine, David, um, has been in this field for a long time. He's, he's worked, um, he started one of the most uh, probably the largest bamboo architectural and design firm in the world. Uh, we were friends on Hawaii, where I've lived for the last six or seven years. And uh, he's been working on this project for a long time. Um, and my role that I see is to come at this same solution that hasn't had, it hasn't, it hasn't been industrialized. It hasn't had a lot of traction, hasn't reached any sort of scale although the technology risk um, has essentially been proven out. So like we know we can make bamboo plywood, we just haven't scaled it up. So my role is to come in and say, okay, we have a technology that we think works. We know where the bamboo is now. And now all it needs is money. It needs a much larger team. It needs access to international markets and it just needs uh, professionalization and sophistication of the technology and the operation and making it into a global company. So that's where my role and mm -hmm. expertise come in, or at least enthusiasm. I don't know. I don't know if it's expertise, but it's at least enthusiasm. And, and that's the case with most new technologies. So the ways that we will address ecology, land restoration, climate change, 
the technologies already exist. There will obviously be frontier technologies that continue to be developed, but we have the tools already to address, um, to address the problems. Most of these are incentives that we need to change. So regulation um, or economic incentives to make um, these technologies already viable. Um, and the big one is just, honestly, it's financing. So the reason why solar doesn't take off more quickly is because of people actually going and implementing projects. And most of those decisions are based on how fast people can make money from implementing these projects. And so de-risking new technologies through new financial instruments, that's also something that I'm, it, it's, it's really a very just like logistical decision on financing these new technologies and implementing them rather than, rather than reinventing everything. So this is a known technology. Um, no one's ever done it before because it, it's a complex supply chain, it's a complex issue. And we just have to string the existing dots together in a way that makes money and then it can scale up very quickly. Right. What is wrong with more conventional building materials such as wood, concrete, steel? Great question. So concrete um, is awful at a lot of levels of someone, uh, you know, sand um, and the other materials are mined. Um, and that's a fairly invasive process that destroys ecosystems. It releases a lot of carbon dioxide from electricity production um, and just the amount of energy that's needed to produce the material. Um, it is a great material to build with. You can make highly technically sophisticated buildings that are very tall, last a long, mm -hmm. long time, very strong. Um, steel in a way is very similar. It's a mined product that has a very large electricity production. So combined, I think those materials make up something like 17% of carbon dioxide emissions. So it's, it's a really big impact. Um, wood is a bit more ambiguous about how it's bad. Sometimes it's good. People can argue that building a tall mass timber building sequesters carbon and that we're harvesting trees in a sustainable cycle. Um, in some countries, that is true. In most countries, it's not true. Um, and the fundamental fact is that when you cut down a tree, for pretty much all timber species, the tree dies. And there are there is damage to the ecosystem, whether from erosion, um, from soil, basically soil loss either into the atmosphere or downstream. Um, and in general, it just maintains a very immature forest ecosystem that never reaches a climax forest of a thousand years old and thousand year old forests are beautiful. And just for the fact that they're beautiful, it's worth keeping them around. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, we don't need more justification than that. So how long why is it, bamboo better? I yeah, mean, how one, long does it, it take bamboo to grow? It takes about seven years to reach maturity for harvest um, from planting. And then you can harvest about a third of the bamboo every year. So you say you have a hundred acre parcel of bamboo, you can harvest all hundred acres, but then you harvest a third of each clump. So it's a very regenerative material. The soil's never disturbed. Um, it basically uh, has a lot of water and soil and sort of like ecological stability effects. Um, and is one, it's a great pioneer species for reforestation. And that's something we've seen in the Philippines as well. Um, it helps address the uh, fires in the region. It helps address uh, erosion and land stability um, and flooding. So uh, it slows down the water cycle, allows more penetration of water into the soil. Um, and is essentially and a, a shade species. So it essentially restores the ecosystem enough for native species to be regenerated, but then also provides an economic vehicle for local people to make enough money so that they're not incentivized to cut down the trees. Mm -hmm. So they are involved in the whole production. Do you, um, do you source the bamboo that is already there or do you also replant it? Yeah. as part of your company uh -huh. business operations. Yeah, so we spent a long time basically going to pretty much every country in the world of where bamboo is. And there's, there's a lot of bamboo in the world. Very few species are usable for timber because they have to be really big. 
And in the Philippines, there's really, really large bamboo, which means that we can harvest it and process it um, and make plywood um, and other engineered lumber products without having to wait seven years for new plantings to come online. So that's what we're doing right now. You know, we've, we built our first factory in 2019. We're building, we just built another factory and we'll build our third factory in the first quarter of 2021. So we're expanding. Meanwhile, our internal goal is to sequester 10 gigatons of carbon by 2050. And that would be 1% of all anthropogenic carbon emissions since humans have been emitting carbon. And that would be huge. And in order to do that, we need to plant about a million hectares of bamboo and establish more than a thousand processing facilities in regions ar around the globe. Um, so in order to do that, we've got to plant a lot of bamboo. That means planting in uh, you know, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, South and Southeast Asia. Um, and right now I'm in Florida and organizing a big plantation operation here. Oh, that sounds so humongous. It's huge. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really large and it's hard to conceptualize how large the earth is and how large the climate issue is. The fact that human beings have actually caused the level of climate change that we have is pretty humongous. Um, and there need to be equally large solutions. Absolutely. Could you walk me through the technology, like in, in big steps, avoiding um, too many details? But how does it look? I mean, you pretty you simple. source the bamboo and then what happens? Yeah. Yeah, so we take wild type um, Dendrocalamus asper in Mindanao in the Philippines and other areas. It's a round pole and we essentially cut small boards out of that round pole. So we cut a bunch of, you know, 10 foot long rectangles uh, out of a round pole and we glue them together. And that makes a piece of plywood. So a four by eight quarter inch sheet of plywood. And that piece of plywood can be the input into almost every building and structure on earth. It's, you know, the most common input uh, into pretty much everything, whether it's a floor, a wall, a concrete form, you know, um, transportation, trucks, ships, everything. And so that's essentially what we're doing. We're essentially building a substitute for conventional wood plywood that is more climate positive, is stronger, more fire resistant, more durable, um, and pretty soon it will be cheaper. And that'll be a big inflection point for us. Uh, the technology is honestly quite simple. It's existing technology that has existed in the wood industry for a long time. Um, in the Philippines, it's a very low level of automation. And as we move to more industrialized areas with higher labor costs, we'll introduce sort of more robotic technology where there are fewer people in mm -hmm. the factories. And, and right now, uh, where is it processed, if I can say so? So right now we're operational in Mindanao, the island of Mindanao in the Philippines. And um, that's it's the, just the place on earth that has the best and largest bamboo and the most of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I see. Would bamboo, do you think, work the same in, in different climates? Say in Canada, where it's colder mm -hmm. than in the Philippines, obviously, or are oh. there any limitations? Yes, there are limitations. Um, you can grow bamboo in Canada, just not this bamboo, and it won't get. No, very no, I big. mean to use it, to use it in Canada uh, as a. Oh, to use material. it, yes, you can yeah. totally use it. Uh -huh. uh, it. It'll be just as, I mean, it's a technically sophisticated product. Um, you know, they're already building mass timber buildings in Canada, and pretty much anything you can build with wood, you can build with bamboo, and it's more effective. In terms of growing, yes, you do have to grow it in hot tropical regions, though luckily most of the new construction that will happen on earth over the next 40 years will happen in hot tropical regions. Um, and so, you know, Scandinavia and Western Europe and the US, we pretty much have all the buildings that we'll have in 40 years with very little population growth, but, you know, India, Indonesia or India and Southeast Asia um, will see massive, massive population growth. And so each of these regions should be growing the material. Uh, that they use and it'll be better and cheaper product. 
Wow, I feel like we're we're gonna we're gonna be growing our own food, our own building materials. It's gonna be a whole uh, circular right. economy, hopefully one day. Right. Who is the um, the ideal client of Rhizome? So right now we sell to lumber companies, basically and interior industrial manufacturers. So basically people who make windows, doors, molding, wall sheathing, flooring, stuff like that. Over the next couple of years, we'll be getting more, basically higher production and more code compliance so that we can build buildings and do structural applications. And that'll be selling to developers and builders that are building everything from skyscrapers to houses. Yeah, you mentioned it's it's gonna be uh, less expensive than the current materials. Was it hard to convince these clients um, to take the bamboo from you? So right now, it's more expensive than structural plywood because structural plywood is made out of uh, low quality softwood. Um, what it is cheaper is tropical mahogany and maple and oak. Um, so basically hardwood that, and bamboo is beautiful, right? The bamboo that you make is a free and clear product that is just gorgeous. So you can, you can look at it all day. I would totally love to live. Actually, I have lived in the bamboo house mm -hmm. and so it's much, much cheaper than, than pretty much any other hardwood and it grows much more sustainably. Like the reason you can't find tropical mahogany anymore is because we've cut it all down um, and it's not really growing back. Right. So we do need a replacement for some of these other hardwoods. As a brand co-owner, what are your predictions for 2021 in this industry? We see a massive increase in interest in climate positive solutions. And that just creates a, just a very strong support for us. So we see a lot of people who are reaching out for employment, to be customers, to be investors, uh, architects and developers who wanna do concept renderings. Like there's a lot of support. And I think that's the case for pretty much every business that is working in climate in some way, that there's such a massive recognition of the need for large scale climate intervention and ecological restoration that if one of your listeners wants to start a business in climate or ecological restoration, I say, go for it. You will be massively supported and you will get to work with people who are equally passionate and interested in this field. And if you're working in a business that is not involved in climate or sort of like actively involved in climate destroying activities, um, there's, there are actually very effective ways to transition your business into ways that are actually in harmony with nature. So, so it's, you know, it is the theme of our decade where we are addressing this issue and we have to address it. Absolutely. I wanted to ask you out of curiosity, the government somehow helps the businesses like yours or it's all like you're doing it on your own. A good, I don't a good know, some question. some cities. Um, you know, I would say that we haven't we haven't been directly supported by government in any significant way through grants or anything like that. Um, you know, I would say government stability is nice uh, so that you can plan for the future, and broadly, regulatory intervention will be essential in accelerating climate intervention to the level that is needed. And that means a price on carbon, whether it's a carbon tax or cap and trade system or uh, a more sophisticated and well-priced market for carbon credits or carbon removal credits where CO2 is physically removed from the atmosphere and put into the ground, into biomass or the built environment. Those are totally essential um, also enhanced regulatory requirements around what pesticides and herbicides. Um, and there are many, many other, and also like whatever land use changes. Yeah. There are many levels of regulation that at least in my perspective are completely essential 
for ecological balance uh, all the way from, you know, whatever ocean protection, um, massive scale conservation areas. And maybe one of the perspectives that I have that is different than some conservation activities is the role of human beings in an ecosystem where what we have come to view human beings as are essentially our presence in an ecosystem destroys the ecosystem. And that's actually not a very nice paradigm to be in. It creates such a deep, what a deep moral conflict for being human. And I don't think that that has to be strictly the case. There are trade-offs in human consumption of whatever timber, of animals, of plants for food, um, but the patterns of urban development that we have don't set a model for how human beings should live with nature. And I do think that there is a model for human stewardship of large uh, forested and natural areas that is actually more protected than human beings simply removing themselves. One, we have impacted ecology to such an extent in many areas that it needs support to regenerate. Um, and the other is if there is a group of people living on land that deeply loves and cares for that land, they are going to support uh, whatever, they, they're going to protect that land over very long time scales where, you know, if you go to uh, a more remote part of the world where there are no people, it's very easy for a logging company or an agricultural company to come in and say, hey, we're just going to cut down the trees. It's a one-time deal, but then you're left without an old growth forest and there were no people to see that. And so I do believe that the role of human beings to actively steward and protect land where they are is an essential role of conservation. We don't need to just remove uh, human beings from conserved lands. Takes a big shift in mentality and then behavior mm -hmm. because it's not up to one person. It's up to many people at the same time. Yeah. What do you find most challenging in your work? It's a good question. I mean, there, there are many levels of challenge. Um, depends how, it depends how honest I, I am on the podcast. Um, I would say one level of challenge is, is working in places where the, where the expectation of how, how sort of like, so we're, we're a modern, sophisticated Western industrialized manufacturing company that has to meet customer uh, requirements for speed, for supply chain quality assurance, for reliability of pricing. And like, like it's, it's a sophisticated industry that we enter into. And inherently, the countries that grow bamboo have cultural systems that are much more laid back. And, the, and I'm definitely not saying that laid back cultural systems are bad. Um, I actually think there's something like deeply wise about not rushing to uh, rushing to get through life and then dying. Um, uh, but there is such a deep mismatch between the incentives of local and indigenous people and a modern uh, standardized way of industry. So I just say, without judging either side, um, bridging, that, bridging that tension is, is a constant source of question for me. Right, well. I'm glad we're learning so many things today. It generates um, a tsunami of thoughts for me, in my brain, in my mind. Um, to wrap up this conversation, what would be your one piece of advice for the listeners of Sustainability Export? One piece of advice that I have is, actually, there, there was a piece of advice that I was given some years ago. Oh. The, uh, the piece of, I, I, I'm not sure how relevant it is, but it seems relevant at the moment. By the time you have found your community, you will be well on your way to having a lot of fun. And one of the things that I've realized by working in a climate-oriented business 
is that the people that are attracted to working in this area are passionate um, and committed to what they are doing. They really believe that they're having a deep impact. Um, but there's also a sense of love and care and fun in it that is just as important as the climate impact. Because there are, there are multiple levels upon which human beings evolve. And uh, a friend of mine has this theory of change. So you can give a man a fish and he eats for a day. You can, uh, you know, you can teach a man how to fish and, you know, that's also, you know, can be fairly effective, the level of empowerment. And then there's a systemic level of asking the question, oh, maybe like, why does this fisherman have to work so hard because there's ecological degradation, there's not so many fish in the ocean, that's a big problem. So just looking at things at a more systemic level. And then there's a narrative level where it's the question of what does it mean to be a human being on earth? And what is a sense of self that evokes a certain set of incentives that then causes an ecological crisis on earth that then causes these guys to not have any fish in the ocean that they want to eat. And that working on issues like climate can be ways of addressing each of these levels um, at the same time, that they're non-exclusive and that they're essential. So to actually run a business with integrity, uh, inherently, we are also working on the narrative level because we recognize, so why do we save the forests? You know, earlier I said that actually just the beauty of a thousand year old forest is enough incentive of itself to not cut them down rather than something about the economic value of the forest or the fact that it's providing ecosystem services for biodiversity. We can have a lot of keywords about why it's important, mm -hmm. but fundamentally it's just because we really love forests and that's a natural characteristic of being alive and that that's enough. And by working in this area, it evokes that sense of love for nature and that can be a deep common ground across, across pretty much any belief system or political spectrum or any other dividing line that we have created. And, uh, and it's fun then because you bring people together, they relate, they save something or enjoy something that they love. And so it's inherently an adventure and fun. Well, I love these words and I love your pure philosophical attitude that is so resonating with me so much. Thank you so much for this interview, for taking the time to share with me and the listeners uh, the, your story and the story of Rhizome and climate positive bamboo building material. Thank you so much, Troy. All the best of luck for the development of the business and in the upcoming years, 2021 and onwards. Cool. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the time. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Thank you so much for being with us today. This was a very mindful, philosophical and interesting. I found it very peaceful, this interview with Troy. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to listen to our conversation today. I hope you found something interesting for yourself, inspiring, enlightening, probably. Um, and you got inspired to take some action today for your life and for the world around you. As always, if you have any questions for me or Troy about his business or about the podcast, don't hesitate a moment reach out to us on LinkedIn. We are both easily findable, approachable, and responsive. Again, if you like the podcast uh, or you love this episode in particular, please share on your social media accounts with anyone who might find it uh, useful and interesting. Like and leave us a review, if you can, on iTunes or Podchaser page. I reply all my pot chaser comments in person and it always makes me very, very happy. 
um, yeah, finally reach out to me on LinkedIn, challenge me with your questions, suggest guests or topics you'd like me to cover in the future. This was Sustainability Explored Season 7 and me, your host, Anna Chashina. Thank you again for listening, for being with us today and until next time, next Thursday. Take care, stay sustainable. Bye-bye.